Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Images in Focus. I'm David Swindler, and with me is my good friend, Juan Pons. How are you doing today, Juan? I'm doing great, David. It's uh, nice to see you again. We've had a little bit of a break as we were a little busy, but I'm looking forward to this episode. Me too. In our last episode, we talked about understanding autofocus. And one of the tools that Juan and I like to use when we really want to precisely control our autofocus is the use of back button focus. In this episode, we're going to talk about what is back button focus and why we like to use it. Well, absolutely. And, you know, the one thing about back button focus is that it's changing the way we are enabling our focusing system. And before we get started exactly what back button focus is, one of the things I want to talk about is what happens when you press that shutter button. So let's go to the first slide. All right. Okay. So what happens when you press the shutter button on your camera? The first thing that happens is that you engage your autofocus system. And that happens when you press that shutter button kind of halfway. Um, at the same time, what's happening is that when you press that shutter halfway is that your metering system is engaged and depending on your setting on your camera, but in most uh, default se uh, settings, the metering is also locked so that you, uh, you can then move your camera around and the, the metering for that particular scene is, doesn't change. When you keep depressing that button and you go all the way down to the bottom of the of the plunge on that shutter, your shutter then is fired and you take a, an image. So what's happening here is there's multiple things, three things happening at the press of that button. And in my opinion, you know, I think that that shutter button is overloaded with functions. Um, it is hard to separate both the autofocus and the metering because they're below both linked and they both kind of get triggered at the same half plunge or half press on that shutter button. And then when you fully depress it, then your shutter is, is triggered. And this becomes kind of challenging oftentimes, especially when you're shooting in, um, in continuous autofocus. When you're shooting in one shot focus, you know, typically when you press that shutter halfway, the focus gets locked in on whatever subject your, your sensor is on, right? And then you get that little confirmation beep. Yes. And the thing is, the camera can have multiple autofocus modes, as we talked about before. Sometimes it has that auto-intelligent mode that a lot of people mm -hmm. will use. And so even though you may think the focus is locked and you press that shutter button halfway, sometimes if you go to move it a little bit to refine your <laughs> composition, it can still change the focus. And so you never quite know how it's going to react when you're using that shutter button focus. Yeah, you know, and, and it, I, I find it kind of almost unpredictable now, now that I've gotten using to, used to using back button focus, when I pick up a camera that has that shutter, the uh, focus uh, enabled on the shutter, I kind of get lost. Um, and, you know, by the way, this is the default setting that most cameras nowadays, I mean, all cameras that I know of, come is to have the autofocus system engaged on the shutter. So we yes. have to actually actively change that. We'll talk about that a little later on. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so what is back button focus? I think this is really important to really understand what back button focus is. Um, and what back button focus allows you to do is provide you a way to decouple the autofocus system from the shutter button. Like in the previous slide, I mentioned that, you know, the shutter button is kind of overloaded. You know, when you press it, you know, you, you uh, travel halfway down the shutter button. Um, the autofocus is engaged and the autofocus in some cases may get locked if you're in single shot mode. Um, now, when you start using button, button focus, you actually move the autofocus engagement uh, mode, if you will, from the shutter. So you no longer are engaging autofocus when you touch that shutter. You're still engaging your metering system, you know, unless you change that as well. That's something you can change in most cameras too, but I, I typically don't change that. I leave the, the metering uh, engagement on my shutter anyways. And what this allows you to do is much more independently control when the autofocus engages. Um, and separate that from all the other functions on the shutter button. And that gives you, you know, a lot better control than you would have otherwise. Um, when you have to kind of play around or work around the, 
the overloaded shutter button when you have both the focus metering and the tripping of the shutter. And you know, this is a really important technique, not only for like wildlife and action photography, but also for landscape photography. And as we kind of go forward through this presentation, we're going to touch on what these advantages of this back button focus is and why it helps us so much with our outdoor and nature type photography. You know, it, it, it's, it's great that you mentioned that because, you know, once you get into back button focus and once you learn it and once you use it and you get used to it, it's hard to go anywhere else. I mean, I can't do, I can't use this shutter button. Uh, I can't use the shutter button for focusing anymore. And you start using it for everything and you find ways that it can help in any type of photography that you're doing. Now, you know, having said all that, you know, this is not the only way of doing things. And you never hear David or I saying that there's only one way of doing things. Yeah. Um, there are multiple ways of doing it. I know people who are, you know, on the top of their game that still use the shutter uh, for out of focusing and that's fine for them. Um, but I have, I've been using the back button focus. I don't know for like, uh, I want to say almost 20 years now. Um, and, uh, and I can't think of any any other way of doing it. And I think it's actually made my photography that much better because it allows me to capture more of the image, especially in, um, in, in high, uh, in fast action photography, which is wildlife, or it could be any kind of sports situation, but also, you know, in landscape, because as we'll talk about it a little later, you can actually recompose much more easily when you're using the back button focus and when you, then when you use the shutter button. Absolutely. Okay. So let's look at, uh, let's go to the next slide and let's look at, um, what the button looks like, the back button focus looks like on a lot of these cameras. Um, so, the the you can see here on the top graphic this is a sony camera and you can see that the button is the upper right hand side and i have it circled there in red and that is the back button focus most modern cameras have a dedicated button on the back that says af on or af or something along those lines long time ago when back button focus was kind of early on in its um distribution if you will you know, some cameras have buttons that looked a little bit different than that. Um, but this is how you would typically uh, engage the autofocus. You can see on the on the lower part, you have the back motor focus on a on a, on a uh, Canon camera, and then on a Nikon camera. And just about all other manufacturers have that same thing. Now, the way that you would um, enable that is going to be different in every camera and if you look here in in the little uh, in the menu on the sony system i kind of have um a highlighted the menu that you would use to disable the autofocus on the on the shutter um, and then on the right hand side we have a graphic that shows you how you would change it on the canon cameras now and David, tell me if this is your experience too, but my experience now with modern cameras is that they come with the AF on button already enabled. Is that you can engage yes. out of focus both with that button or with a shutter, right? Correct. Yeah, that's the default mode of all cameras I've seen is that the shutter button focus is the default, but you can also control it with the back button. But if you're controlling with the back button, then as soon as you press the shutter button, it kind of will, it, it can also change whatever you've done with the back button. Yeah, and, and that's why what you want to be doing is, and uh, um, and we'll talk about this a little later on, but you in the, like the Sony, there's a specific menu item that allows you to turn off the, sh the autofocus mode from the shutter um, or the autofocus function from the shutter. And the same thing with the Canon. The Canon does it a little bit differently, and the Nikon does it a little bit differently, and the Fuji and Olympus. So you have to go through and, and, and take a look at how um, how to do that. Okay. Yeah, and the purpose of this video isn't to give you specifics on how to do it with your camera. We're just going to go over why you should do it, and then you need to go out and look at the specific instructions for your model of camera on how to set that up. Right. So, David, do you want to tell us why back button focus is such a, such a big deal? Absolutely. And the main reason I like to use it is because it gives me that fine grain control over my autofocus. You know, I can control exactly where that autofocus occurs, when that autofocus occurs, and then it's not going to get in the way of when I'm taking my photo. Uh, 
And it allows me to work within my autofocus system strengths and it allows me to work around my autofocus system's weaknesses. And, it, you know, when I'm using uh, a continuous autofocus, when I'm shooting wildlife, for example, it's a huge benefit because with uh, continuous autofocus, that autofocus is, is constantly working. It's trying to find exactly where it needs to go. It's trying to track a subject. It's trying to maybe find the eyes of that subject and hone in right on that animal. Well, the thing is, I want to have that all set up and working in the background. And I want to be able to fire my shutter independently of that autofocus system. And one thing it can allow me to do is I can focus on that animal, then I can quickly recompose to get a better shot of that wildlife. And we're going to show you several examples of that recompose and then shoot technique. The same thing with landscapes. In order to really maximize my depth of field, as we talked about in the last video, I want to be able to focus about one third of the way distance wise into that scene. Well, where those autofocus points initially land, it may not be at that one third point into the scene. Uh, one of the ways the autofocus system is designed to work is that each time you kind of uh, press that shutter button halfway or hit that AF on button on the back of your camera, it's going to kind of cycle through different type, different autofocus point arrangements. And sometimes I may need to hit that button one, two, or three times to kind of get the autofocus point arrangement that I'm after. Or I could be in like a zone type mode and maybe I don't have time to go move to a different zone. And so I just want to point the camera down get it to focus where I want it, move the camera back up, now I'm ready to shoot. But if I have the autofocus system engaged or, or part as part of the shutter, then if I move that camera, it's going to change my autofocus. I don't want that happening. I want to be able to have the autofocus set where I initially put it, and I don't want it to move again when I go to take the photo. And so this is another, this is a technique that's really useful with DSLRs. And it allows me to not have to constantly switch between AF modes or to have to constantly switch between AF points on the back. Switching between those AF points or the zones all the time, it takes a lot of thought and it takes away from my ability to shoot creatively and to shoot quickly. You know, one of, one of the biggest challenges that we run into, we see our clients running into all the time is where the camera you know, you have your subject in focus and all of a sudden the autofocus decides to focus something in the background or oh, okay. something in the foreground, right? Oh, um, it happens so much. And, and being able to independently turn on and off that focus by pressing on that, on that uh, autofocus on the back, we can prevent the camera from doing that, right? Oh, yes. Uh-huh. And or if the camera does jump around, I can quickly go back and force it to get right on my subject and then I can go and switch, uh, go, go back, you know, to, to shooting because, you know, our subjects are moving and, you know, if our subject does move a little bit between when we have focused and when, uh, when, when we're ready to take the shot, well, now I may need to quickly go back, reacquire that focus, move the camera up and I can be doing this all in one go and then I'm ready right. to fire off a right. burst of shots. And yeah. So that perfect action sequence. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of a good segue onto the next slide, right? Because uh, do you want to talk about a little bit there? Yeah, because the autofocus system will miss. It's going to happen. There's not nothing you can do about it to get 100% of your shots in focus. But what we're going to, what we're trying to do is increase the percentage of shots that are going to be sharp focused. And I find with back button focus, my percentage of sharp shots goes way up. Now I'm not... Uh, focused so much on, okay, well, what is the camera trying to do to kind of read my mind? Instead, I'm saying, camera, this is what I want you to do. And then, then it follows suit. And by not engaging the autofocus system all the time, it's also going to allow the camera to shoot at its full frame rate. If I'm trying to capture that perfect action sequence of, uh, let's say, a two bighorn sheep ramming their heads together, well, if the camera is trying to focus throughout that burst, uh, which would happen if you're using that shutter button focus, well, guess what? It's going to slow down the camera's frame rate because in between shots there, it's trying to reacquire focus, reacquire focus. Well, if those bighorn rams are basically at the same plane as they ram their heads together, 
there is absolutely no need to be a reacquiring focus during that sequence. I want to capture the full frame rate so I can get the perfect sequence right in the middle of that uh, action shot. Well, I, I mean, that's absolutely right. But, you know, it goes even beyond that, right? Because, you know, if you don't have the autofocus engaged, you're free to move and re recompose a little bit and change your composition even by a little bit left and right and not have to worry that, your focus point is going to fall on the floor in the background and all of a sudden your focus is going to go, you know, out. You can just, you know, once you acquire focus and as long as that subject stays in the same distance between you, um, you know, from you, you can not have to engage that focus and just keep shooting. You know, every so often I'll go in and, you know, tap it. You know, once I know that focus point is on my subject, on especially around the eye of the subject, I'll tap that button just to confirm that, you know, everything is good, or if the subject has moved a little bit. You know, the one thing to remember also, for especially for wildlife, when you're shooting subjects that are far away, you know, even if they move, you know, a couple inches, a little bit, you know, uh, from you or away from you, that's not going to materially affect your focus. Um, you know, if they're at a good distance away, which is usually what we're doing for wildlife. So you don't have to worry about having that autofocus engaged all of the time, which is what happens when you use this autofocus system on the shutter, right? Correct. And that's a really good point that you bring up. Now, if that animal is like real close to you and you kind of get right. frame filling shots like that, then yeah, you're going to have to kind of engage that autofocus system more often. Or if you have a subject that's like moving towards you or moving away mm -hmm. from you, then of course you're going to yes. have to engage that. But the nice thing is I can control that myself. I'm not allowing the camera to take over that function. And so if I know that the animal's kind of running towards me, then yeah, I will have that auto fo autofocus system engaged continuously. I'll be pressing that button on the back of my camera. And, but if the animal's like uh, kind of staying within that same plane of distance as Juan just talked about, I'm going to leave that alone. And then there's less chances that the autofocus system may pick up on something besides my subject, like a blade of grass in the foreground or a bright, shiny object in the background. Right. Like you said, the autofocus system is going to mess up. It's going to miss. There is no perfect system out there. So what we're trying to do is mitigate, you know, part of what we're trying to do is mitigate, you know, those misses, right? Exactly. Okay, so what do we go on to the next image here? So this is kind of an example of what we're talking about. So I typically have my focus uh, point, uh, center focus point engaged. Um, so in this case, for this particular shot of, of uh, this bull elk in the winter in Yellowstone, you know, I put that center kind of near the eye, near the head, you know, near the antlers where I want my focus to be on to be critical. I want those eyes to be spot on. But then what I can do, if we go to the next slide, I can then recompose and shoot as much as I want to. You can see that this um, that this elk is not moving. So as long as it doesn't move, you know, it could turn its head or it could move, you know, move its head a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, and my focus would still be, you know, spot on. Um, but I can, I'm now free to recompose and not worry that my focus will go back on that water or on the background back there and completely ruin my shot. As again, as long as that animal is not moving. Let's look at another example here on the next slide. Um, and this is, again, this is a, a, a grizzly bear in uh, British Columbia. And you know, I, this animal was actually very, very close to me. It was probably about, uh, I wouldn't say less than 10 feet away from me, um, you know, in a very safe situation. But one of the things I want to do here is always make sure that that eye is in focus. So I'm able to put that eye or that uh, focus point on that eye. And then uh, we look at the next slide we, and, you know, recompose for a better composition. Move my bear a little bit to the right to give a little bit more room to the left, which is one of the basic rules of wildlife photography. You want to give um, room for your animal to move into. So this is why it's, you know, for me, using the bat button focus is 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 so useful because I can I can focus on the part of the animal that I want to have in full focus and then I am free to recompose and not have to worry about my my focus changing. Now, exactly. 
one of the things that we talked about was that we um, uh, need to learn how to work our autofocus system. We need to learn its advantages and disadvantages, pitfalls. And one of the biggest pitfalls that I run into all the time, or what I've noticed that autofocus tend to fail on most of the time, is in what I call transition zone. So let's take a look at the next slide here, David. Um, and what I mean by transition zones, like for example, if we look at this example of this bald eagle in Alaska, and when I'm trying to capture this bald eagle in flight, for birds in flight, um, they are usually going from three different transitions or three different backgrounds. I'm shooting against the sky, then I'm shooting against um, trees, and then I'm shooting against the water. So what happens is, as I follow this animal coming in from the sky onto the trees and then onto the water, what I have noticed is that, and this is irrespective of camera systems, I've seen this on all camera systems, is that the autofocus system kind of gets tricked and fails when you're when that animal is transitioning from that sky over to those trees, right? Because now you know it was expecting. You know, a, a clean background, now it's getting a, 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 a kind of a busier background and the autofocus kind of stumbles. So one of the things that I used the bat button focus to overcome this limitation of the uh, uh, autofocus systems is, you know, as I'm tracking that bird in the sky, I'm mashing down that uh, back button focus. And I, my camera is, you know, tracking that bird pretty easily because there's a nice clear sky behind it. But as soon as I see, as I notice that those trees are coming into my view and that bird is going to cross over onto those trees, I let go of my back button focus. Um, as soon as the bird completely completes the transition onto the trees, I then press again that back button focus. And then I repeat that process again when it goes between the trees or the shoreline there onto the water. Um, now, if I hadn't done that, if I had kept that back button focus pressed, what may happen is that the camera may pick up on those trees and decide to focus on those trees. And if the camera does that, you know, as most of us have experienced, you're kind of done at that point because <laughs> the lens is going to rack out almost to infinity for to try to focus on those trees. And there is no way you'll be able to refocus back on that bird that's much closer to you. So this is one of the advantages that you have by using back button focus in that I can very quickly, you know, turn on and off the back button, the, the autofocus system by letting go of that back button much more easily. Um, and what that's going to allow us to do is, if we look at the next slide, is be able to capture images like this one, where the animal is going from different transitions. That eagle is going from sky to mountains to trees and then down to the water. Um, and I'm much more, I have much more, uh, many more keepers, if you will, by following this technique, by being able to manage sort of the, the weaknesses of the autofocus system. Let's look at the next slide, and this is another image of uh, a different... Um, a different eagle um, coming here into landing into the into the water again. You know, in order for me to keep that focus on that animal as it crossed over from those boundary lines super fast, doing that technique of what I call feathering your back button focus can actually improve your chances of getting images that are in focus. Exactly, and if we even look at this image a little closer. You know, as that eagle's going to come in, he's going to have periods where his wings are fully extended. And the thing is, you don't want to have the focus jump to the wingtips when the wings are fully extended, because then the face of the or the eyes of the eagle aren't going to be sharp. And so this is another thing that Juan can do is, you know, when the wings are fully extended, he can let go of that back button right. focus. And then as soon as the eyes become visible again, you can re-engage the focus and know that you're going to get a sharp shot. You know, and the, and the advantage of doing this, right, with a um, bad button focus, because you can kind of do the same thing with uh, with a shutter, but you can, you know, independently be shooting and engaging the autofocus system. So now when you're yes. shooting, you're, the autofocus system doesn't have to be engaged all of the time, right? You can control yes. those two functions independently, which to me is a huge advantage.
Yeah, because maybe you want that shot with the wings fully extended, but you you know you've locked in the focus on the face of the eagle. Right. And if you're using the shutter button focus, the autofocus system would jump to what's closer to you in a lot of cases, which would mean it would focus on the wingtips. It would lose focus on the face. And now you're not going to get that result you wanted. Right. And and also, it, it, you're right in that it focuses sometimes on the closest thing, but also uh, focuses on movement. Right. It sees movement and it tries to lock on that movement. And guess what? Those wings are moving more than the head of the animal. So the autofocus may want to actually move over to, to that part of the screen. Yep, exactly. Now, Juan talked about some advantages with wildlife, but there's also a lot of reasons to use back button focus for landscapes. And, you know, one of the things with landscapes is that sometimes when the light's really going nuts or I'm just <laughs> kind of trying to figure out my composition and, or, or something like that, I'll shoot handheld. And sometimes shooting handheld allows me to kind of find my composition faster. And when I'm shooting handheld, back button focus comes in handy so much because now I can find where I want it to focus. I can cycle through those auto focus modes by, or the different point arrangements by hitting that back button, get it to focus about a third of the way into my scene. I can recompose if needed to get it to do that. Then I know that focus is locked. I can go back and I can take any number of shots with that focus locked, knowing that it's focused where it should be. It's not gonna jump around and accidentally focus on the background. I'm gonna get that proper depth of field. And once again, you know, I want to be focusing for landscapes about a third of the way distance wise into that scene. The camera gets tricked a lot with landscapes because sometimes the bright, shiny object is in the background. The camera likes to focus where it sees the maximum amount of contrast. Sometimes that happens where you have like that mountain, distant mountain against a bright sky. Well, I don't want it to focus there. I may want it to focus on that darker rock and about a third of the way distance wise into my scene. Um, I, right now, I'm out here in southern Arizona on our storm chasing workshops. And when we're photographing lightning, we're using a lightning trigger. And that lightning trigger will kind of take control of that camera. Well, before I turn on that lightning trigger, I like to use the back button focus to, get, to, to lock in my, my autofocus. Now, if I left autofocus on with the shutter button, well, every time that lightning trigger tries to fire a shot, it's going to try to acquire focus first. And guess what? It's going to completely miss the lightning bolt. And so since I have back button focus turned on, I don't have to keep switching my lens to manual focus. Anyone who's using shutter button focus, every time they turn on their lightning trigger, well, they also have to take their lens and switch it to manual focus. And so there's a lot of advantages to having the back button focus. Uh, because now I don't have to keep remembering, okay, did I switch my lens to manual focus? Okay, now I need to switch it back to autofocus, yada, yada, yada. Another thing that I see very often, uh, especially with a lot of my workshop clientele, is that we'll be shooting sunset. But then as the light starts to drop and we're moving into like blue hour and twilight, well, the darker it gets, the harder it's gonna be for that camera to acquire focus. And then they'll be trying to take a shot. The light's perfect. You got those soft pastel -y hues. And they're like, why isn't my camera taking a picture? <laughs> and the reason why is because it's hunting to, for that focus. And it can't find that focus. And so it absolutely, absolutely will not take the shot. If you're using back button focus, well, guess what? You can uh, make sure that that focus is going to acquire at a higher contrast spot. Uh, you can ensure it actually does engage, and then you can go and take as many photos as you want without worrying about it not shooting because it can't find your focus. Uh, that, that that is that's a, that's absolutely uh, brilliant in that you know one of the things that I I honed on that you mentioned, which I thought was really important, is the fact that you're not engaging the uh, autofocus you know, all of the time. In other words, you're not having to switch between that manual focus and that autofocus, right? Because mm -hmm. you are, you know, in essence, in manual focus all of the time, except when you press that button on the back. Exactly. So it's kind of like having uh, a manual focus mode just right there, ready to go. Uh, there's also a lot of lenses out there that al allow you to do uh, manual focus override. And so if it's not picking up quite the right focus, uh, you can quickly grab that focus ring and do a quick manual focus override. 
Well, if you're using shutter button focus, uh, that kind of defeats the purpose of that manual focus override. It's not really going to work because as soon as you go to hit the shutter button the rest of the way, it's going to change that autofocus. So let me jump in with this example from Olympic National Park. This is not a static scene. We've got waves that are coming in, they're going back out, they're coming in, going back out. And there's a lot of things here that will trick the autofocus system. Uh, I want, uh, to, in order to maximize my depth of field, I want to focus kind of on this rock right here. That's about that third of the way distance-wise into my scene. But when we have no wave coming in, this is just a very dark rock on a black sand beach. The autofocus system is not going to preferentially focus here. Instead, it's going to see this nice high contrast boundary of the sea stack against the sky, and it's going to probably focus out here. And then when a wave comes in and picks up some of the light like this, then it may jump and it could focus down here, it could focus over here, it could focus back on the background. Well, my job here as a landscape photographer is to try to capture that perfect wave sequence. Whether I get the water coming in or going back out, I want to get that nice receding, uh, slightly long exposure look to it. And that's going to require me to take lots of shots. In fact, I think to get this image, I had to probably take around 20 different shots. But each time I press that shutter button, I don't want the autofocus changing. I want to set it once, and then I want to be able to forget about the autofocus until I'm ready to change my composition. Back button focus allows me to do that. And so when I was setting this up on the tripod, I kind of angled the camera down a bit, and I got the autofocus points to kind of grab this rock right here. Then I could move my camera back up to my desired composition, and then I could just wait as those waves would come in, I would fire off a bunch of shots. As another wave would come in, I'd fire off a bunch of shots. And then in the end, I could go back and pick my favorite. So this is one place where uh, having back button focus really pays off. I never had to worry about the camera accidentally coming in and focusing on the background. And then all of a sudden, I lost all my foreground depth of field. All right, so this is kind of a way to very quickly switch between like a manual focus and autofocus, right? Without having to flip exactly. that autofocus to a manual focus switch on the back, uh, on the lens or on your camera, wherever it may be. And one thing I find all the time is people that use the shutter button focus and they have to keep switching between autofocus to manual focus. Well, so many times they go to take another shot or change their composition or they zoom in or zoom out. Well, they forget to change it back. And then right. they have a bunch of softer, blurry shots. That's the last thing you want. That's one thing you cannot fix in post-processing. <laughs> if you screw up the focus, that shot is toast. It's going to go to the garbage can. Agreed. Here's another shot from Death Valley. This was a super windy day. So windy, I could barely stand up straight on the top of this dune. And you can see how the wind is just transporting all this sand off the top of the dune. Well, there's a lot of things here, too, that's going to trick the autofocus system. Uh, you have this really well-defined boundary on these mountains back here, very high contrast between the mountains and the sky. But up here, you have this sand coming off the crest of this dune, and it's moving. It's changing. The contrast is constantly uh, changing. You know, if the wind blows more, there's going to be less contrast. If the wind blows less, you're going to have more contrast on the edge of this dune. And the other thing is I was hand-holding because a tripod isn't going to work when I can barely stand up straight. And so I'm up there. I'm just trying to get the shot and get the camera back in a plastic bag so it doesn't get hammered with sand. And the back button focus helps so much because now I can make sure I focus somewhere around here, which is about a third of the way distance-wise into my scene. And I don't have to worry about the camera's autofocus system picking up on these background mountains. And then as the sand changes the look of the scene as it's blowing across, the autofocus system isn't going to change. It's going to be set wherever I had it initially when I hit that back button on my camera. Uh, here's another example of a waterfall. I'm shooting this on a tripod. Well, the camera is going to preferentially try to focus on this higher contrast of the waterfall in the background. Well, if that happens, my rocks are going to be soft. I don't want that. Uh, instead, I focus about a third of the way distance-wise into my scene, which is probably going to be about this rock right here. And then I can just take as many shots as I need to at varying shutter speeds to kind of capture the mood of this waterfall that I want. Now, we talked about many advantages of back button focus. 
But yes, there are some drawbacks to be aware of. Juan, how about you describe what some of those drawbacks may be? So really, I mean, the biggest drawback that we have is, in my opinion, is the fact that there's a steep learning curve um, to using bat button focus. You know, for a lot of people who have been using folk autofocus uh, linked onto the shutter, we've sort of developed a muscle memory, if you will, or a way of shooting that takes that into account. So you need to retrain yourself. And this is a long um you know, a long process. This is not something you want to do on the spur of the moment. I tell people this is definitely not something you want to do when you are uh, on a on a trip, you know, once in a lifetime type of trip. You need to go ahead and retrain yourself. You know, because it is it 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 it's a different way of thinking of how you're going to compose, how you're going to focus the scene, how you're going to track your subjects. So yes, you do need to retrain yourself, and that could actually take a very long time to do. Um, and we'll talk about you know how to do that in in, in uh, uh, on the on the next slide. Now, now the other disadvantage here is that when you're handing the camera to somebody else to take a shot, let's say you want to hand somebody the camera to take a picture of you in that amazing location that you're in. You know, there people are used to just pressing that shutter while the camera will auto focus and take the shot. In that case, the camera's not going to auto focus, and people are going to be a little frustrated. Um, so if, you, if that's something you find yourself doing often, um, what I would suggest is that you set up a custom mode on your camera for those kinds of shots where the, um, the, the uh, back button focus is, uh, is disabled, if you will, or the focusing system is re-enabled on the, on, the, uh, on the shutter button. Okay, yeah. so... Sorry, did you have a, a comment to say about the drawbacks as well? No, I really like that idea of using that custom mode. That way you're not trying to go through these buried menu functions to try to figure out how to re-enable the autofocus with the shutter. You can just have that as part of like your custom mode one, two, or three, and you can just quickly flip your dial to that mode, hand your camera to someone else, and now it's going to function like a camera that they're used to. Right. Now, you know, how to train yourself for back button focus? You know, and again, you don't want to do this. You don't want to switch. You don't want to try doing bat button focus when you're on a expensive once in a lifetime type trip. Because guess what? You're going to come home and most of your images are going to be out of focus because you're just not used to using that. So what you need to do is you need to practice at home. You need to develop the muscle memory for using you know, uh, for using bad button focus. So you want to practice at home. You know, one of the things I tell people to do is find a fast food, you know, restaurant with a big parking lot and lots of seagulls. And we can find these just about anywhere. And use that to practice back button focus on those fast moving subjects, those seagulls. Um, but you could also practice this out when you're shooting landscape. I mean, what I would do is I would practice as much as you can because I think this is going to be crucial in order for you to retrain yourself and be able to succeed when you're out in the field when it really matters. So you got to practice, practice, practice. There's no such thing as practicing too much. And then once you're comfortable with that, then I would take it and and, and uh, apply it on one of the one of the uh, once in a lifetime trips or when it really does matter. And so as far as setting up back button focus. That is so specific to your camera and the type of model that you're using. So there's tons of resources online. Just do a quick search. You'll find some instructional videos that will tell you how to set up your camera for optimal back button focus operation. But we hope that this video was helpful to you to understand why we like to use back, but back button focus. And if you're not already using it, we hope you'll give it a try. But as Juan said, make sure you do it at home and that you practice first before you go out on that really important trip. But from our experience, the number of good, correctly focused images should go way up once you start using this particular technique. Yeah, I mean, again, it, it's going to take a while. It's going to be frustrating at first. It's like, you know, you're going to hold on to your camera. You're like, whose camera is this? Why can't I use this camera? It's going to be a little frustrating at first. But, you know, again, you know, there's if there's no pain, there's no gain. you gotta you got to plow through it, you know, be persistent, uh, persevere. And, you know, I guarantee you that 
you know, if you end up using it, you will think to yourself, you know, six months down the road is like, how did I not use this before? Because it is, Absolutely. you know, that much of an improvement. Well, folks, yes. thanks again for joining us. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. And if you did, make sure to share it with your friends. Uh, subscribe to our channel and hit that little bell to be notified when we upload new episodes. Thanks again. And until next time. Take care, folks.